Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the UZAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Shoresman Animal Medical Center in New York City. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event, Dental Essentials, Practical Oral Care for Dogs and Cats with Dr. Ada Toe. This webinar is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have questions or concerns about your pet's health, it is always best to consult your veterinarian. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. We'll be taking questions via chat and we'll save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. I'd like to take a quick moment to let everyone know about two upcoming online events. On Thursday, March 14th at 6 p.m., we will welcome animal behavior scientist, Dr. Michael Maria Delgado to discuss her brand new book, Play With Your Cat, The Essential Guide to Interactive Play for a Happier, Healthier Feline. And then on Thursday, April 4th at 6 p.m., veterinary behaviorists from the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine will join us to talk about cognitive dysfunction syndrome in dogs and cats. You can find more information and register for these events on our website, amcny.org slash events. We'll also have that information in our newsletter that goes out this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Ada To is a resident veterinarian in dentistry and oral surgery at AMC. She earned her veterinary degree from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Afterwards, she completed an internship in small animal medicine and surgery at Blue Pearl in New York City before joining AMC's very busy dentistry service. She gave a fantastic lecture for us last year, and we are so grateful to have her back with us to lead tonight's event. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ada To. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that introduction and welcome everyone um, and welcome anyone new who didn't join me last year. Um, but today we're going to talk about some old topics, some new topics, and let me just start to share my screen. And one second. All right. Um, hope everyone can hear me OK. If you can't, just please let one of our lovely moderators know. Um, but today we're going to talk about dental essentials, so practical oral care for dogs and cats. And the goals of my presentation today is I want to give you an overall understanding of dental health, starting from puppyhood or kittenhood and going all the way into adulthood for your dogs and cats at home. Um, we're going to review the treatment options for certain dental um, diseases or oral um, diseases that you typically will come in to see us for, um, and then overview of at-home dental care and what you can do at home. And so we'll start with puppy and kittens. We'll talk about their baby teeth and what complications that are related to it, um, occlusion or their bite, um, and juvenile gingivitis. Then we'll lead into periodontal disease in dogs and cats, tooth trauma, so basically fractured teeth. Then uh, cats, we're going to focus on tooth resorption. And then the thing that a lot of people asked for last year, gingivostomatitis. And then we'll start um, talking about at-home dental care at the end. And so puppies and kittens, what should you be looking for? So we'll start at the basics. So how many teeth do dogs have from puppyhood to going to adults? So this is a good picture of a good dental chart and formula that we use all the time. So baby dogs or puppies have about 28 teeth total that are gonna grow in. Um, this is a dental formula we use, but basically they'll have three incisors or front teeth, one canine teeth in each section, and there's four quadrants in the mouth that we kind of chart all of them together. And then their first three premolars are going to come in. And then once the adults come in and around six months of age, the extra premolar comes in and then the actual molars come in. So the 28 teeth turn into 42 teeth. And this is a picture of, you know, how much more teeth they're going to get. Um, for cats, they'll ha they have a little less teeth. They have a little smaller mouths. 
but they have about 26 teeth total when they're young kittens. Um, same thing, they all have three incisors, a canine tooth, and you have three premolars on the top and two in the bottom on either side. And then this is a nice lovely picture that we use all the time as well. Um, and then when they go into the adults, this is another formula to show you or this um, dental chart. But the difference is that now their molars come in. So 26 teeth total turn into 30 teeth total. So a pretty substantial amount of teeth that are in our dogs and cats. Uh, when they do erupt, so dogs overall, they usually erupt around five to seven months of age. I know I said six months there, but every dog is going to be different. And so we give this age, um, age range about when all their adult teeth should be coming in. And for cats, it's a little bit earlier, or should be coming in a little bit earlier, around four to six months of age. And then this is a nice eruption schedule. So their baby teeth, starting from their tiny, tiny incisors all the way in the front of their mouth is going to be about three to four weeks of age. Cats kind of lag behind two to three weeks. Canine teeth are three, three to four weeks and so forth. And then my biggest ish, uh, my biggest um, thing that I want you to take from this is that when do those adult teeth come in? And so now we're going into bites. So what should a normal bite or occlusion look like in a cat and dog? And so what you see here is the front or the top teeth of the incisors or the maxillary incisors. They're just sitting right in front of the bottom incisors right here. And so that bite is normal in the front. And that's what you want to see and what you like in a dog or cat. On the side, they have a scissor bite. And so this bottom tooth, this canine tooth, if you can see my pointer or my um, arrow, should be sitting right in between that top incisor tooth here and that top canine tooth over here. And that's a normal occlusion there. From the back on, all these premolar teeth, they're kind of in this kind of scissor-like pattern where this top premolar is sitting in this nice triangle on the bottom right here. And that's normal. And that's what should be seen in every dog and cat. However, not every dog and cat is the same. And so we go into occlusion. So the class, there's four types of occlusions. The first one is called a class one. Everything is normal like we talked about before, except there are a couple teeth, usually your incisors or even your canine tooth that are kind of out of place. And so this is a good example of a case I saw early on in my career here. Um, all the occlusion is normal. She has a nice scissor bite on the side. That canine tooth is where it's supposed to be. But the thing is that her incisors are sitting right below um, the bottom incisor, sitting right under her top incisors. And when she's biting down, those two those sets of teeth are chomping onto each other. And that's what led to her fracturing this front tooth right here. And so she came to see us for therapy. Uh, we opted to put braces on her. These are just some fun examples. So yes, doggy braces are possible for the right patient in the right condition. And afterwards, I um, just want to show you, she was a, we were able to pull those bottom teeth backwards and have that those front teeth on the top sitting in front. And so the before picture is on my right here, and then the after picture is on the left. So you see how they're not hitting those those two sets of teeth are not hitting each other anymore. It's sitting right behind now. So happy for her, great. Um, class two malocclusion is your next type. And so basically it is when that lower mandible is um, shorter than your top upper jaw or what we, some people call an overbite in a way in which that top jaw is hanging over. And so you can see it mainly in dogs as well. Again, it's not necessarily very common, but we did see in a, in, a, in a cat recently. And so this lower jaw is sitting right below. And when that happens, sometimes we worry about those bottom teeth causing a trauma or ulceration or a hole in the roof of the mouth, which is starting to happen in this young cat or kitten. And so you see here, those two teeth are really riding behind. It should be sitting right in front. And yeah, this is another good view. And so that's a class two malocclusion. Class three is when you have that underbite, quote unquote. So your lower jaw is gonna be longer than that top jaw here. And this one is kind of a mild version. So those teeth that should be sitting right behind, but those top incisors there are actually riding way more out. 
And although this canine tooth in the bottom jaw is supposed, it is sitting in the right place, you can see it's displaced so much cranially or forward that this is what we call a class three. And a lot of times you're gonna see it in your brachycephalic breeds or your short nose breeds. So it's gonna be um, like your bulldogs, your Frenchies, things like that. And sometimes even pit bulls and your Shih Tzus. Hold on a second. And then class four malocclusion. So that's the last type of occlusion. It is very uncommon, rare, but we see it. And it basically means the asymm asymmetry of your upper and lower jaws. So it can be asymmetry side by side, up and down, front and back. And then in this dog, the left and right sides of the jaws are uneven. So one side is longer than the other and one is shorter. And so that sometimes you'll hear it in layman's terms called the rye bite. We don't really use it in our service as much anymore, but if you hear your regular veterinarian talk about it, that's usually what they're per alluding to. And so what issues should you look out for puppies and kittens? And a lot of times they get those retained or persistent deciduous teeth. So it's been past five to six months for your cat or dog. Those baby teeth are still there. I mean, I have a cousin that I'm pretty sure that their dog is two years old and this still has baby teeth in them. But why is this such an issue? Why should you do something about it? And so when you leave that baby tooth in, it's gonna cause displacement and trauma to that eruption of your adult tooth at any point. And some issues that can occur is that that baby tooth, so in this picture that you can see here, there's a baby tooth right here and right next to it towards the tongue side, there's an adult canine tooth trying to erupt in. And so that adult canine tooth, since there's something blocking its way out to come towards the lip side, it's going to want to ride into that hard palate or the roof of the mouth, which is not ideal. Um, sometimes when you have a baby tooth, the adult tooth doesn't grow out at all, and that can cause major issues. And another thing, and which I'll get to later on this lecture, is that it's going to perpetuate periodontal disease. So this dog is a little older than one, about one to two years of age. But you can see, um, you know, without brushing, or even if you're, um, the owner is brushing, those two teeth are crowded. This is the baby tooth, and then this is the adult tooth right here. It's built up a lot of plaque and calculus, and it's going to perpetuate that periodontal disease or gum disease. So treatment is usually we would like to extract it. Usually by the time we see them, it's around one year of age, so they're about ready to come out. Um, and also it correlates to when owners want to spay or neuter and such. And, you know, is that tooth actually causing an issue? Usually the canine teeth and your incisors, like these incisors, these are the top row right here. These are your babies. It's blocking the adult incisors coming in in the front. Those should most likely need to come out all the time because they're going to cause an issue for your pet at home. Um, in here, so another example, those baby incisors, this canine tooth, we should take it out. We shouldn't perpetuate this gum disease in this dog. We should let this adult canine ride out further up into the jaw. And then also some premolars have not been taken out or not fallen out on their own. So that needs to come out too. Um, sometimes we do keep baby teeth in and that's usually when there's no adult counterpart to it and usually those are the premolars on the side of the mouths so those are okay as long as there's no issue caused on x-rays that we see when we do our dental procedure it's okay to leave it there and continue to monitor but if there's an adult counterpart that needs to come out we need to take it out another issue that we see in young dogs is traumatic malocclusion what i've been talking about previously so um usually a uh, issue is a lingually displaced or base narrow mandibular canines. And again, that just means that lower man that canine is trying to ride up into the roof of the palate. And a lot of times you will acquire a hard palate defect and that would lead in terms of an oral nasal fistula or basically a hole connecting the mouth into the nasal cavity, which is not fun. Sometimes when it's mild, it continues to be a continued and dull oral pain, which a lot of dogs are not gonna share with you because their threshold for pain is very high or until it's very severe, they're gonna say something or not do something like eat. And also it's gonna affect other teeth in its way or how it's gonna grow and again, perpetuate that gum disease. So in this 
picture. This is a frontal shot, but my most concern is on the left side of this dog, that lower canine is wanting to ride right into those two top teeth, which is gonna displace those two teeth. And also it should be sitting right here on my arrows, if you can see it, between that third incisor, the upper third incisor, and that canine tooth growing in. So, and it was also causing trauma to the hard palate, which is not ideal. So what can you do? And there's, there is something you can do at home. So usually we'll start this at five months of age for these puppies that come in and it's called red rubber ball therapy. It is basically um, helping that tooth and guiding that tooth as they're chewing on this ball for five to 15 minutes a day, either holding it on that side or chewing it three times a day, every day for one to two months, encouraging that tooth to grow into the appropriate place. And you'd be surprised how well it works sometimes. And it's the easiest thing yet that you could try to do, quote unquote, quote unquote, easiest, as long as your dog is willing to chew. And things you can use are rubber Kong toys. You want to use a rubber ball or rubber toy of some consistency that is slight, just ever so slightly larger than the mouth size of the dog. And that can be hard to find, but these Kong toys work really well. And this that's what this owner did. So that was the before. We recommended rubber ball therapy for her. And now it's sitting in the right place like magic. So now it's in between those two top teeth like it should be and not causing any issue to the hard palate. So when that rubber ball therapy work doesn't work or you've tried everything and none of, none of the home care stuff works, um, what should you do? So come see us where we can talk you through treatment options. Um, and it depends when you when you go see your veterinarian or dental specialist. So if you see someone at a very young age and that puppy or cat still has a lot of deciduous teeth or baby teeth, um, sometimes they would recommend removing those baby teeth. So putting them under anesthesia for removing the baby tooth in order to allow that um, adult tooth to grow in an appropriate place. Um, if that deciduous tooth is still there and that adult tooth is growing in as well, should we, you know, extract that baby tooth again to allow that tooth to move um, outwards um, towards the lips in order to be in the right place as well. And then in this picture, sometimes we may even resort to orthodontics or elastic chains and putting kind of like an acrylic on the um, palate side of that upper jaw. And again, this is all in terms of encouraging that lower tooth to grow in the right place, not hit the hard palate. And the, you know, some options are also to do what we call a crown reduction vital pulp therapy is when we basically blunt the edge of that lower tooth that's causing any issue and putting a filling on top where that tooth is still gonna be vital, that root is still healthy, but now, you know, it's not gonna cause any issue, but we did cause a little, you know, damage to that tooth um, by, you know, trying to fix another issue. So there's a lot of options that, you know, the least fun option is extracting the adult tooth overall, but, you know, talk to your veterinarian, come see us and, you know, we'll walk through you through all the options. And another thing I see in young cats, um, especially, but dogs can also get it too, is called juvenile hyperplastic gingivitis. And so basically it is just inflammation of the gums in a very young cat. It can be at the time of tooth eruption or later on, so as early as three to four weeks. Um, and it can develop into periodontitis, which is that gum disease or inflammation that we'll talk about later on if treatment is not pursued. And so breeds that are commonly seen in are, you know, we um, are your purebred breeds like Siamese, Somali, Maine Coons. Um, you can see it in your domestic short hair cats as well, um, but usually the purebreds like to get them. There's, we don't know the cause of it. There's just speculation, like cats are a mystery all the time, um, but it's suspected to be just an immune response to either the eruption of the tooth, the bacterial load that, you know, um, sinks in on the tooth as well, or if they had some kind of viral, viral exposure as a kitten, like FIV positive, FELV, feline leukemia, or Khaleesi virus. And signs that you'll see are bad breath or halitosis, that, that severe inflammation and edema, um, bleeding gums. Um, but sometimes pain, it's a plus or minus because sometimes they really are not painful and they're not going to share that with you, even if you press on them. So it's kind of hard to say, but usually they don't have inflammation in the back of the mouths. And that's going to be an important point later on. Um, and then usually they have like 
um, large gingival enlargements on the crown of teeth and formation of kind of these fake pockets that are not ideal. And so what are your treatment options for when you see this? So teeth brushing, which we'll get into more later, um, that's most ideal if you can start early, start them young. Um, sometimes you can use a chlorhexidine rinse, which is an antibacterial rinse to decrease that bacterial load in the mouth. It's called Novodense. Um, but a lot of times they're going to recommend in these young cats as early as nine months of age to come in for a anesthetized dental procedure, which we have done a lot recently. We've done cats as young as six months of age as well. And usually a recommendation is you'll do these anesthetized dental procedures about every three to six months. Here we kind of try to be a little more conservative and do every six to 12 months because we understand it's anesthesia. Um, we perform gingivectomies, which is when we trim back the gum tissue to prevent those fake pockets to house any bacteria. But once it develops into this juvenile onset periodontitis or that gum disease again, you may have to consider extractions of the diseased teeth. And again, this is all correlated with x-rays at the same time as well under anesthesia. And so phasing out from uh, young dogs and cats, now we'll talk about periodontal disease. So when you hear dental disease, again, dental disease can mean a lot of things. A lot of times it's alluded to periodontal disease, and it's basically a pathologic process of progressive attachment loss around a tooth, usually below the gingiva, so you can't see it, but it goes through periods of active destruction, which is that periodontitis or inflammation I'm talking to you about, or periods of quiet when it's, you know, not having an inflammation or pain or any clinical signs. And again, periodontitis, active inflammation of your periodontium, which we'll go over what anatomy structures that is in the next slide. And it's due to that plaque or bacterial biofilm that forms every day in your mouth 24 seven. Um, again, it, it occurs underneath the gingiva and I just want you guys to know that it is a chronic and progressive process. It's not something that, you know, we'll do a dental cleaning one time and it, it disappears forever. It's something that's going to be there forever once it's there, but it can be maintained and we'll go over how. And so what is your periodontium? So things that are affected by this gum disease is the gum tissue itself called the gingiva right here the periodontal ligament, which is below the gum, and it holds that tooth in each kind of pocket in the mouth. Your cementum, which is kind of the extension of your enamel, so that white portion of the tooth that you and I have as well, and it goes underneath the, gin the gum line as well. And then the bone or the socket that the tooth sits in, um, that is all your periodontium. And so your function of that is to anchor your tooth it also cleanses and protects the tooth and it serves as a sensory tissue as well. And just bonus points, the pulp chamber is the root of the tooth. It houses all your nerves, vessels, and also things that help grow the tooth from within as well and adding more layers to it. And so how prevalent is periodontal disease or gum disease? And so in review of a lot of literature, it's a range about 80 to 85% of the population of dogs and cats will get periodontal disease. And it can start as early as two to three years of age. We are specialty hospitals. So I've seen it as early as six months or even a year of age, even though I don't want to, it does happen. Um, so how does it happen? Why does it all start? Where is this gum disease coming from? And so it's coming from the bacteria in your mouth, which is something out of our control sometimes, but we can maintain it. Um, it comes from the salivary glycoproteins in our mouth from when we're eating, and it forms these kind of dental pellicles within seconds. So if you can imagine these little bacteria or these protein molecules forming like tiny little bubbles right on your tooth. And then from those pellicles, it be kind of kind of kind, it becomes a kind of um, area where the bacteria can colonize that pellicle. So grand positive aerobic bacteria colonizes it and then forms this plaque biofilm, which establishes within 24 hours or one day. So within one day, it's going to happen just like that. And then afterwards, more bacteria come on in, gram negative anaerobic bacteria. So that means they don't need oxygen. And then it colonizes that biofilm after another 24 hours or um, immediately after that 24 hours of that initial bacterial wave. Um, then that biofilm is going to mineralize and become calculus, the things that you can actually see and 
um, elicit you guys to say, hey, it's time for a cleaning. And that happens within 48 to 72 hours. So when the, within one to two to three days, these things can happen if nothing is done in the mouth. Um, and then once you have that calculus, you have gingivitis, which is something just inflammation of your gums, which can become reversible within 24 to 48 hours. Um, then it becomes that periodontitis or inflammation of all those gummy structures we talked about before. And that happens within one to three weeks. And that becomes irreversible with some caveats, but mainly irreversible at most points. And so cofactors in periodontal disease, small breed dogs are most likely to get it just because of their size, how they're eating, their structure. And if you know, you're not brushing at home, toy breed dogs, pure breed, purebred breeds. So your miniature schnauzers, Maltese's, Italian greyhounds, I just saw one today, um, had terrible dental disease, um, cats, um, Abyssinian, Somalis. But again, it's that, that list is just an example. There's a whole other list as well. Um, dental abnormalities as well. So crowding of your teeth, like we see here, um, that abnormal bites that we talked about before, the malocclusions, and then again, your persistent baby teeth. We don't like those. Genetics do play a role in a bit. Again, greyhounds, sighthounds, they love to get dental disease or periodontal disease. And then also systemic health and altered immune response. So having diabetes can also um, lead to bad dental disease and vice versa, bad dental or periodontal disease can also lead to insulin resistance in some cases, and then just overall immunosuppression of the body. Um, sometimes it's more likely for dogs or cats with dental disease to get kidney issues and, you know, having bad dental issues can cause, um, can cause worsening of kidney disease, vice versa. Um, but also older age, you'll see a more likely in those patients, abnormal chewing behaviors and diet does play a role, especially if you give canned food, um, if you're not brushing. So the canned food is just going to stick and glom onto your teeth versus, you know, if you give the dry food, it's going to, they have a chomping motion. As long as they're chomping on it, at least for like 30 seconds, they're able to, you know, scrape off any calculate, I mean, plaque that way. Um, so that does play a big, big role in gum disease as well. Um, local consequences, things like if the dental disease doesn't go checked or with your regular veterinarian is pathologic jaw fractures that we do see quite often here, um, oral nasal fistula, so that connection of the oral cavity into your nasal cavity, you'll see loose teeth and tooth loss. I've had lots of owners come in and show me all the tooth that has been lost already because of periodontal disease. And then the biggest thing when you come to the ER is, you know, tooth root abscesses. So things, especially like the molars or the premolars in the back that become so diseased that you can't tell obviously because they're all the way back there, but they start to swell because there's an abscess there from the root of the tooth and cause a facial swelling and causes that fistula or opening there, causes pus discharge to come out. Sometimes it can affect right underneath the eye, the swelling there. And also I've, I've had owners tell me, you know, the mouth isn't great, but they see just a lot of sneezing or bloody to mucoid-nasal discharge all the time. And, you know, they're worried about rhinitis where actually sometimes it is the oral cavity and the teeth itself because of periodontal disease. And clinical signs that you see, so bad breath, again, that inflammation of your gums, um, is there enough tartar there? And I would, I, you would be surprised, even dogs with minimal amount of tartar, I've taken out a bunch of teeth just because those back teeth really aren't, you know, cared for all the time. Um, are they reluctant to chew on a certain side? Do they not want their head pet? Are they pawing at a certain mouth um, area? Sometimes dropping of the food is the first sign that you'd see the sneezing that we talked about, the nasal discharge, um, whether there's any weird jaw movements, um, reluctance to eat hard food. Um, we, the owner today, she said her dog did not want to eat any hard food. Um, but after the dental today and knowing that she had very severe periodontal disease, I have a feeling that that may change um, from soft food to hard food. Um, hypersalivation or excessive drooling and the draining tracts that we talked about, the tooth root abscesses, 
And then the caveat is your decreased appetite in drinking. That is a very ambiguous sign. Again, there's so many types of diseases that can cause it, the kidney disease, the heart disease. You know, is there something else going on systemically that we should check out first? So, and usually I will say it has to be quite severe until a dog or cat is gonna stop eating overall or have, lose weight from dent periodontal disease. It can happen. It's just, you know, usually there's something else going on. So start with blood work, which is something we need anyways for an anesthetized dental procedure. Start it from there. And if, you know, you start to rule out everything else, then, you know, hey, maybe it is the oral cavity itself or you see something very apparent. And so going into professional dental care, a cohat. So when we call these anesthetized dental procedures, they're called cohats. And so they're your complete oral health assessment and treatment. General anesthesia is mandatory in our case. And I know there are a lot of places, or I hope there's not as many places now that offer anesthesia free. It's cheaper, I understand, but then in a way is you're not getting the whole assessment and health treatment part as well. Um, sometimes they don't take x-rays. You're only really looking and cleaning above the gum line. You're not assessing what's below the gum line. It, that's a mystery. And so you maybe it looks sparkling clean above the gums, but again, the owner today, she she's only had kind of no oral x-rays basically. They did do anesthesia, but because there were no x-rays taken, the back teeth were going unchecked of all these kind of almost becoming tooth root abscesses and pain that the dog was not showing her, but it was something that's very apparent. And so making sure they have x-rays at wherever place you decide to go to, making sure they do anesthesia is very important because then we can chart each tooth carefully, take those x-rays, um, give the appropriate treatment. Um, periodontal treatment needs scaling, um, and then also whether teeth need to come out, whether there's other treatments we need to pursue if we want to save teeth. And the frequency, you know, we say, hey, come once a year, but we understand anesthesia can be a big and scary thing for some people, and even to the healthy dog or cat. Um, so we'll always have a talk with you about risks and benefits. Um, what kind of diseases does your cat or dog have? Can we do this anesthesia? Is it safe? And we'll always have that conversation with you. And we want you guys to be comfortable too with what we're doing before we do anything as well. Um, again, some examples, taking the x-rays, making sure you're taking it in each quadrant. This is a dental unit that we use over here. And then this is example on the left of a dog we did a before and after cleaning of. We've done the x-rays and we're doing the charting on their other side. This is charting of a cat, but this is kind of like a template we have of every tooth. So we're looking at every tooth very carefully. And this is a probe that we use to make sure how deep that pocket is and making sure that pocket isn't deep enough where it's something that is concerned as a concern. And we kind of put all that information together and then create the treatment plan for your animals. Um, one other thing I would say is that also with anesthesia free, your airway is unprotected. And so usually we have a tube as in this picture here that protects the airway. So all the water, all that bacteria is not going down the windpipe or that the lungs. Um, and with anesthesia free, you don't have that. So there's a risk there for aspiration or aspiration pneumonia. And then now going to stages of dental disease, stage zero is clinically normal, nothing, which is great. Stage one is that inflamed gum tissue, um, and there, but there's no attachment loss. Okay, so we're still doing okay. Um, stage two is the earlier early periodontitis. So now you start to have less than 25% attachment loss. Stage three, we're getting into moderate levels, 25 to 50% attachment loss. And stage four, which is the most severe stage, is the severe periodontitis or greater than 50% attachment loss. And when I say attachment loss, this is all correlated together with the pocketing depth on the charting, the x-rays, of how much bone loss is there. And this is just an example of a dog with moderate to severe periodontal disease, because a lot of times that tartar hides a lot of things and it could honestly go either way. And so treatment options, periodontal cleaning, we start off by putting a rinse on to decrease aerialization of the bacteria when we're scaling. We do the scaling, we do it above the gums and a little bit below the gums as well. Obviously we can't go all the way down to the root. We're polishing every tooth to smooth out the surfaces um, after the scaling. And then sometimes for you know owners that really can't do a lot of brushing at home, their dog or cat is quite fractious to it. 
etc. You can consider oral sealant called Sanos. There's pros and cons to it. It's not 100% that, hey, this is going to prevent dental disease overall, but it's just some an option that we can use. Um, exodonics, meaning do, does this tooth need to go? It has more than 50% bone loss. The pockets are way deep going all the way to the root. Let's take it out. Um, open and close root planing. We're kind of scraping out all that bacteria. If that tooth is borderline, we can still save it. We can get rid of the bacteria and overgrown um, skin tissue that's growing underneath the gums and give a chance for that tooth. And then lastly is guided tissue regeneration, which is something that we keep for owners that um, can do at-home dental care because it is something that needs to be done even after this procedure. Um, it's basically we um, help rebuild that bone um, and seal it back over and give that chance of that severely diseased tooth um, to stay in the mouth but also means you have to not only do home care, but come every six months for that anesthetized dental procedure, ideally within the first one to two years, and then kind of see how it goes from there. Um, so it's not for everybody. Um, now switching over, we're gonna do dental trauma. And so dental trauma is something that um, is very commonly seen here as well. So when I'm talking about dental trauma, I'm talking about dental fractures. So about 26% of the dog and cat population will have some kind of fracture of the tooth in the mouth. And the tooth fractures can be either that there's pulp involvement, meaning that the root of the cat, the tooth is involved, or there's no pulp involvement, that it's just a fracture, it's just the crown, there's no pulp involved, great. Um, this is, these are just examples, so complicated. So this is example of, oh, great, there's, you know, pulp involvement now versus, you know, this is now, there's no pulp involvement, it's just that white portion, the crown is fractured off. Um, whether it's the fracture is just isolated to above the gum tissue or the crown versus, you know, has it fractured in a way or aka slab fractures where it's fractured underneath the gum line and going to cause issue there. And a lot of times you can't really tell at home, maybe if you can get a good look, but that's when you go to your regular veterinarian or you go for yearly checkup and they're like, hey, there's something going on. Look at this fracture and whether or not they can address it there versus, you know, coming to need to see a dental specialist. Abrasion is something of wearing of the teeth, and that's usually chewing an object, especially tennis balls. The uh, fiber on the tennis balls when they're chewing really wears down the tooth and it becomes sometimes it becomes involved into that pulp cavity or the root of the tooth as well sometimes it doesn't and so again very important to take a look um, and something we look at during our assessments under anesthesia and you know what happens if you leave that pulp cavity open um, and not do anything about it there's going to be this continued pain your dog and cat, again, it's not going to show any, you know, signs of that until it's a level 10 out of 10 or 8 to 9 out of 10. Um, and endodontic disease, which basically means, so now your cavity is open, so you have bacteria coming all the way down from the crown into the root of the tooth, and that in turn can create your tooth root abscess or disease at the root of the tooth and cause issues down the road that way. And so if you have pulp involvement, what can you do? So a lot of people come to us for a root canal therapy. We want to save the tooth. We want to keep it in there. We basically um, clean out the dead root of the tooth because at that point, that's what has happened. Clean it out, put a filling in. Um, and then sometimes we do put a nice crown on it. It just helps um, decrease the chances of the filling falling out. But again, it has its pros and cons. It's a lecture in and of itself. Um, this is an example of we see a lot of police dogs. They do a lot of bite work. And so they need these crowns. They need that extra strength to hold that root canal in place and that filling in place. And so we put that crown on. And then this dog, unfortunately, had both of his canines break off. So one had a crown and one was too short to do a crown. So we just had to put a really strong restoration or filling on top of it. And sometimes, again, the root canal therapy isn't for everyone, um, not just cost, but also the vitality of the tooth. So can we even perform it? And that, again, goes back to the charting of the tooth. Is there gum disease? Um, looking at the x-rays, is there a lucency at the root of the tooth that is making us concerned? Or is there something called resorption of the tooth as well, another disease process? And can we even do the root canal therapy? 
Um, if there's no pulp involvement after we, you know, probe and pride in that tooth area, great, you know, we could either do nothing and just continue to monitor it with um, radiographs at every time that he comes in for a anesthetized dental procedure, or do we do a restoration? Has it fractured enough to the point we're worried that it's about to go into the pulp cavity, so we need to put a filling on top? And those are basically chair side decisions that we make each and every day. And then the slab fractures are tricky. So the crown root fractures, has it fractured below the gum line all the way down or you know just below that gum line? And usually, unfortunately, we opt to extract it. You can do a root canal, the chance of it failing, again, there's no hard numbers or studies on this just yet, but the chance of it failing is higher just because now that fractures underneath that gum line. And now you're also worried not just about internally diseased or anodontic disease, but also that gum disease as well. It always comes back. It's never, you know, a one stop and shop and that's it. And so how do you prevent it? Let's avoid any hooves. Let's avoid bones. I know they always say to give your dog a bone, but avoid the bones, avoid the antlers, avoid tennis balls for the abrasion aspect of it, avoid any super, 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 super hard plastic toys. And the rule of thumb is that, you know, if you think if you're going to chew on it, you're going to break your teeth, don't give it or, you know, indent your fingernail in it. If you can't indent it very well, don't give it at all. Don't offer it. And next, we're going to transition into feline tooth resorption, another very common disease in cats. And Again, very common. It's a painful process and it's basically the erosion of hard tissues or that tooth. And what happens is that jawbone is trying to resorb that tooth back into its own bone. Um, and it's it's just super painful and it's very ulcerative sometimes, as you can see in this picture. About 25 to 75% of cats will get it. So again, it's a it's a big number, it's a big range, but we see it quite oftenly. And it's progressive. It can lead to root resorption. So sometimes it even starts at the root and you won't even realize it, and, um, to be honest. And sometimes there's crown fractures that will happen, or it sometimes causes an open wound um, with that resorbing root remnant present and going on just like here. Um, at least 33% of cats will develop tooth resorption at some point in their lives, and the likelihood just increases with age. So we usually see it at four to six years of age. I've seen it at, in a cat at two years of age. And unfortunately, the cause is unknown. Cats are a mystery sometimes. Again, is it something viral related? Is it it's their immune response to the teeth or the bacteria on, on the teeth? We just don't know yet. Um, diagnosis is, again, your cohat, your anesthetized oral procedure, that's how a lot of times we find the secret tooth resorption that you can't see um, above the gums, per the charting that we do, the x-rays, and this is a good example of an x-ray of a tooth that in the root here, it's resorbing, and then also in the crown as well. And then treatment of choice, usually we can't save them. It's extractions, whether, you know, it's so res the roots are very resorbed that we just cut off the crown or we have to take out the whole tooth, root and all. Next, transitioning into, a lot of people ask, is feline chronic gingivitis. And so again, it is another inflammatory process, except this is like the top, top, top inflammation or inflammatory process that we see. So severe inflammation and ulceration of your whole oral cavity. And again, it can be the whole oral cavity, it can be a portion, it really depends. Um, and the clinical signs you see, again, oral pain, difficulty swallowing, poor appetite, and that's usually in the very severe cases as well, and weight loss. Prevalence in the cat population is about 0.7 to 12%, depending on what study you look at. And the average age that you see um, cats get this is around seven years old. So it's usually an older cat disease. Um, again, we don't know the reason why. If someone can find the reason why, please let us know. But there are studies going on. Um, but again, is it the hypersensitivity to the plaque bacteria? Is it a viral component? Um, how do we immune modulate those little tiny factors that are causing this inflammation in the mouth? Something along those lines. And the diagnosis is usually presumptive. So you see all that severe gingivitis and inflammation. It's not, it's not only on your gum tissue itself. It kind of bleeds into the top of the oral cavity and into the kind of outs, um, inside of the lip sometimes. And the biggest, biggest thing that we can differentiate between stomatitis versus, you know, that juvenile gingivitis, is it, or is it 
dental disease, a periodontal disease, or is a tooth resorption, is the back of this mouth in this picture is very, 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 very inflamed. And that's usually the number one indication of, hey, this is stomatitis. We need to do something. Um, and that is what we call bilateral caudal mucositis. Sometimes you can biopsy it. You don't necessarily need to all the time, but if there's something else like a mass that you see, sure, let's rule out, make sure it's not something cancerous or an, another immune mediated disease as well, but it's not always necessary. And so treatment. So what happens if let's say you just go the med medical conservative management route, it's generally not enough. Um, people have tried tapering steroid co courses like prednisolone, um, antibiotics, um, opioids, all that. Those are pain medications, but usually the treatment of choice is partial to full mouth, mouth extractions. Um, so this is as a case, this cat had multiple issues going on, but she also developed stomatitis. And this was after we took out all our teeth. And then this is... Um, one month down the road or two months down the road. So completely healed from the surgery, everything is quiet there. And so she had full mouth extraction. She had that caudal mucositis or caud back caudal inflammation. Um, but the thing is that this is also not a complete cure in most cases. Um, also, it's very important to note that if any tooth remnant left um, at all, it can also continue to flare up this gingivostomatitis. But even if you do full mouth extractions or, you know, you sparse it out and you do the back teeth first and the front teeth later on, you still have 30% of those cats that are treated that are going to be refractory to it all. And so you still need to continue medical management. So again, are we doing the steroid course? Are we using another immunosuppressive like cyclosporin? There are um, treatments out there like viral treatments called feline recombinant interferon omega or mesenchymal stem cell therapies. Um, and then in very severe cases, if the quality of life is poor, you know, some, some people will opt to use or, you know, go the route of humane euthanasia, but usually we can do something before we, it gets to that point here. And so now um, we've talked about old and young diseases. Now we're going to go talk about, you know, what can you do at home, dental care at home. And so number, number one thing, and I've already alluded to it a lot of times is please, please, please try toothbrushing. Just, you know, try it. I know it's hard. It's not easy, um, but it is the most effective home care plaque and gingivitis control method. And in one study, they, you know, sparsed it out, but daily brushing or at least every other day with a soft brush, bristled nylon toothbrush of your choice will be very effective. And it's that mechanical motion, that movement, that removal of that plaque biofilm we talked about that is going to help with that periodontal disease. And so when should you start it? Um, when you start to notice a smell, you know, honestly, start it as early as possible, one year of age if you could. Get them desensitized if you're having young puppies and kittens, get them used to, you know, fingers in the mouth, a brush in the mouth, get them used to that positive reinforcement. So after you stick a finger in for 10 seconds, they get a treat, something like that. They get a churro and then having a consistent routine. Again, we're human. Sometimes you forget that's okay, but you know, try your best uh, at least twice a week if you have to. Um, and even if you're, you know, following all this, you're doing the best toothbrushing, we acknowledge here that, you know, some places are harder to reach, like the inside portions of the mouth are hard, especially if your dog or cat is fighting you, and the molars in the back are hard to get, we totally get it. Um, and so that's when it's really important to, you know, come and talk with us about, you know, doing those cohats, those anesthetized dental procedures, because sometimes you do need that scaling in the back, at least maybe once a year to, you know, really treat that disease and give that periodontal treatment as well. And so these are some toothbrushing examples. Um, this was a dog I had last year. He did just come out of anesthesia, but he was like this the whole entire time. He's a lovely, lovely dog. Um, and then this is just an example of brushing teeth. So I'm lifting up the gums. He's opening his mouth for me. So he's letting me get the insides. But I'd say those are bonus points for everyone. If you can get it, I would focus on the lip side um, portions of the teeth. So the outside portions, and then again, just some examples there. Um, again, same dog, 
my motion is back and forth, but honestly, you can do a sweeping motion. So starting from that gum line, going down, sweeping down, going in circles, that's fair too. And doing about like 30 seconds on each quadrant. So one, two, three, four on every side. Um, and again, bonus points if you can get on the inside, that's awesome. But, you know, don't hurt yourself doing it and don't, you know, make your dog or cat angry from doing it as well. Do what they can. And then this is a lovely video by the previous resident, Dr. Ford. This is his cat that they brush. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. So pick your toothpaste. Again, tooth we'll get into toothpaste, but sure, pick a toothpaste, get him used to it. Does he like it? Does he do not like it? Get Inside the cheek, doing it almost every day of the week. So even before brushing the teeth, getting them used to toothpaste, you're getting them used to a toothbrush or a finger in the mouth. And then go ahead and adding it to that toothbrush itself. And then he likes the circular motion. That's totally fine. And so he's doing that circular motion as best as he can. He's licking it great. Again, 30 seconds each side. Again, there's four sides. Two on the top, two on the bottom. And then uh, I like this video. So this guy has two hands, has trained it. He is now to brush this. This guy can brush into the house to reduce the heights of the house and put it. We're losing your audio a little bit. I think probably because this audio is coming up. So, sorry, what? Oh, we were just losing your audio. I think it's because of this. Like, there's audio which we can't. Yeah. So, just oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, um, don't say anything too important. <laughs> well, we, it's all is that. Um, nothing super important, but just that this guy can brush a hippo's teeth. You can do it too. Try your best, but afterwards he's giving that hippo a nice snack. So again, reward your animals at home with something that they really like, like a treat. And toothbrush recommendations, anything that's a very microfine or soft bristle, things that I like to use, I usually use it on myself as well. It's called a Nimbus um, or Nimby Kit toothbrush. It just has these really fine bristles on it. The toothbrush that is really um, good for gums at home. Um, it's helped with my gums. It definitely helps a lot of people have liked it. But again, any toothbrush, I'd say opt for the soft bristle type. Um, but any toothbrush that you can use or your pet is accustomed to. And then other adjuncts, again, toothbrushing is number one, number, number, number one number one. <laughs> and then other adjuncts are toothpaste. So if your animal is not liking a toothpaste, it's not the end of the world. I know we like to use toothpaste, but for them, it's not as necessary. It's that mechanical motion is most important. And But toothpaste that you can use is CET enzymatic. I know a lot of people like a pet smile as well. Um, if you can't brush for some reason, there's an aversion to the brush itself. A lot of people have told me, and you can do this as well, is dental wipes. So MaxiGuard dental wipes. Again, it doesn't have those bristles, which can get a little bit underneath the gums, but the, that motion, that mechanical movement of the wiping, if you can even get all the way back there, that's totally fine with me. And then some, they also make a gel that some people like as well, and we like too, this brand. Um, there's also dental diets and treats. So treats like greenies, anything that they can crunch on, honestly. So I know some people only feed predominantly wet food and, you know, whether it's because of a health issue or something else, that's okay. But if you can put in or sprinkle in a little bit of treats, that's fine. But again, if it accept, upsets your animal's stomach at home, don't give it, you know, it's going to be a trial and error kind of thing. We understand. And also just watch out for calories of the treats. They're also prescription diets. They're formulated to a certain size, scientific size. And because of that size and how your animal bites on it, that also cleans off the plaque and tartar that way. But again, your animal has to chew on it a specific, or it has to chew, it can't, they can't swallow it whole. Um, they have to like the diet as well. And then the water additives are super, super low on my list. Again, if you do toothbrushing, you can do all of these as well. That's fine with me, but toothbrushing is number one. 
And then overall, so I just wanted you guys to get from this lecture today or this presentation that, you know, I want you to recognize um, young oral health issues or dental issues all the way into adulthood and catching them early on. So you can either see your regular veterinarian, veterinarian or come see a dental specialist here um, like us. Or, and also it is a multimodal approach to maintain oral health hygiene overall. And that is very key. So again, your yearly exams with a veterinarian of your choice, um, whether or not they need to be referred to a specialty dental service like at AMC. Um, if you can do oral exams at home, great, awesome. And then being aware of the clinical signs we talked about or the dental diseases we talked about before. Um, tooth brushing, again, I think that's the hundredth time I said it, that's the bingo word today. Um, and then using the other oral health products we talked about, that's totally fine. And then just don't forget that, you know, I understand anesthesia can be scary, but, you know, talk with us, having those anesthetic oral professional evaluations, those cohats are very, very important. And they're sometimes important because you can't get to those places that, you know, you do great at-home oral care and that's where we come in and we can help and guide you in how to improve your skills at home. And then some resources at American Veterinary Dental College, very great resource. Um, the Veterinary Oral Health Council are basically board certified dentists that are part of it and review literature of all the products that are out there. They even have their own website, which is VOHC. So you can go to their website and look at of all the approved listed products. But I will say take it with your grain of salt. Um, there are sometimes no studies about certain products, but doesn't mean it's a bad product. Again, it's trial and error at home. And then AVMA as well, great resource. And now we can open the chat to any questions. All right, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. To. This was fantastic, another wonderful presentation. Um, if you want to just unshare your screen and then we can take take a few questions. We do have a bunch. Um, one thing I, I, if you want to just speak about um, is what to avoid in toothpaste. Um, someone was asking that. So just um i guess fluoride you know you don't want that and and you know or anything like that yeah usually you don't want fluoride like the human grade toothpaste they all have fluoride in it basically except maybe the kid ones but i'd say just use any the pet marketed ones because i know for sure like cet pet smile that they don't have any of that so fluoride no fluoride yeah. okay great great um and then we had a question about the type of toothbrush you can use humans as, as the one you showed was um what about a finger brush yeah finger brushes are fine i know there are a bunch i know there are some that are just like the rubber parts are on the finger brush i don't love those because that can be very hard on the gums so i'd say opt for one that has a soft bristle one if you're going to aim for a finger toothbrush okay great and then we had um a question that a cat, their cat that likes to chomp on the toothbrush. <laughs> what to to do about that? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not mad about that. I don't know how they're chomping, but sometimes a chomping it is helpful in a way. Again, I like that mechanical motion. It may wear your toothbrush out faster, but you know, pros and cons of everything. So I'm not too mad about that. Honestly, it might even get on the inside of the tooth as well. So great, great. Um, and then what about the time of day for toothbrushing? Does it, you know, night? morning or night can you give your cat food afterwards should you wait a little while mm -hmm. um afterwards. any time of the day we usually say once a day again bonus points i've had owners mm -hmm. tell me they do it twice a day so up to your discretion so. okay great um and then what about feeding them should you wait for a while after um it doesn't matter so you can do it after they eat you can do it before i get it that you know the food is going to stay there so if you want to do it but after they eat that's totally fine but again per your schedule how you can do things so okay great um obviously greenies everyone knows a lot so helpful but toothbrushing more mm -hmm. important would you say yeah Toothbrushing is number one, but I understand if you really can't do it, you can't put anything in like any foreign object in their mouth like that, then yes, the treats, the uh, dry diets, the treats. So if you can switch to a dry diet, your dog or cat has otherwise no other health issues, that mechanical motion is going to help. And the key is that they're not swallowing these things. If there's a swallower, it's not going to really work. So. Okay, great. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, can let's we'll switch gears a little bit. Can dental disease impact digestive health and bowel issues? 
Technically, yes. But, you know, is it, you know, the reason why your dog or cat has inflammatory bowel disease? That is something that's up in the air. It's not 100%. It's not definitive, but it can contribute in terms of how much still unknown. But I wouldn't necessarily say that dental disease cause, you know, let's say inflammatory bowel disease, but it can also, it can definitely make things a little bit worse, especially how severe it is. Okay. Um, see, are toothpaste okay for cats with um, chronic kidney disease? Yes, there should be no effect on that. But again, I worry more about can they tolerate it on their gastrointestinal system? Okay. Um, what, what about electric toothbrushes for cats? I've had people tell me, I again, I, I'm okay with it. Just I would prefer a soft bristle. <laughs> and I know sometimes the electric ones, the bristles are quite hard. So if you see you're causing some bleeding, maybe just ease up a little bit on the pressure. But I think that's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, a cat with myasthenia gravi gravis that does get plaque despite trying to brush her teeth. We've been told to be careful when teeth are clean. Can you comment on how her teeth should be professionally cleaned or at home as well? Talk. Again, I think it's something that you can come talk with us. We are a specialty hospital, and so we can go through the pros and cons with you. We do have a great anesthesiology team, but you know, if you do think it's time for dental cleaning, we can you know take a look go over the pros and cons with you. I think it's, you know, maybe it's time to talk to a, pref a veterinarian and have that discussion. Um, because if you're saying that at home care is starting to fail a little bit, maybe we should have a talk closer about that regarding um, your cat. Okay, yeah. great, great. Um, we had a question, is there a way to check a dog's bite like you can with humans? Yeah, so I want you, so if you're gonna check a bite, I want you to look at the front and then look at, the both sides. And then there are great pictures on the American Veterinary Dental College website that you can also go to as well, or you can look back at my presentation and kind of um, piece it together on how to look at the bite that way as well. So, so you, I think they said also, like you do with wax paper, I guess, with humans uh, or so with like wax or something. We don't necessarily yes. do that. It's just more of a clinical picture that we see. So we can see it on exam. We don't need to like have them bite down on anything. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, and, and just remind everyone that we will send you both this presentation and we'll send you um, a document with these links, um, you know, via HC and just, a, you know, all of this as well. Um, and then uh, bully sticks, are they, you know, and those sorts of longer chews, are they okay? Uh, it's, it's, I would say avoid them because I have personally had bad experience from owners telling me that they their dog has broken their teeth on it. But I know there's a cartilaginous part of the bully stick that's okay. So I'd say avoid them, but you know. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm curious too, just about the dot, you were saying the braces. What are those mm -hmm. used for? Like what type of those? Um, like, like before in the presentation. So yeah. to encourage movement of um, specific teeth. So that usually that lower canine there is causing trauma to that palate or the roof of the mouth. And so we're pushing other teeth away. So that's not happening. So we're usually using braces to prevent trauma to other teeth or other aspects of the oral cavity. That's okay, great. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. My cat has bad breath. The doctor doesn't see any problems. Could it just be the buildup of bacteria? Um, yes, but also your doctor is only seeing above the gum line. So there may be something below the gum line that you can't see. And so, you know, maybe time to think about doing that anesthetized dental procedure. Okay. Well, I think that's a great way to end. Um, thank you again so much for, you know, spending this time with us and all for giving all this valuable information to everyone. I think it was so informative. Everyone saying thank you so much. Um, you're great. Um, and thank you to Maria Moiser, AMC's digital marketing specialist for helping out tonight. Um, and a very special thanks to all of you for spending part of your even, evening with us. It's really your engagement and curiosity that makes events like this so rewarding and meaningful. Um, so thank you again for that and take care. We look forward to seeing you at our next event.